So among the classical hallucinogens, you have many sources, but acting at one chemical action. LSD, psilocybin, a mescaline. There's a secretion of the Sonoran Desert Toad uh, that is also hallucinogenic, but they're all serotonin type 2 agonists. Um, classical hallucinogens are defined on the basis of this receptor binding. Ibogaine does really not have much effect at this receptor. The expression of the opioid withdrawal syndrome in animals, if you remove most of the serotonin from an animal's brain, it doesn't really affect the expression of the opioid withdrawal syndrome one way or other. It doesn't increase it, doesn't decrease it. In contrast with Ibogaine, there is no preclinical or case report evidence that suggests a significant therapeutic effect of classical hallucinogens and opioid withdrawal. Um, the focus group, or the group of lay drug experimenters in 1962 that Howard belonged to, surely, I know this uh, from Howard, that they experimented with quite a few classical hallucinogens. If classical hallucinogens reduced uh, opioid withdrawal, they would have noticed it because they noticed it with Ibogaine, and they didn't. Uh, and uh, there are other people I know who are experienced uh, with Ibogaine that have had the unfortunate experience of going into withdrawal while they were on it, and uh, uh, LSD did not really help this. Ibogaine uh, also has structural analogy to the harmala alkaloids. These are agents that are mixed in ayahuasca to potentiate the DMT uh, by inhibiting its breakdown. They may also have psychoactive, uh, psychoactive effects themselves. There's a whole bunch of them, uh, and they're called, you know, the family, the structural family is called beta carbolines. Um, there is um, no um, significant affinity at sigma 2 and MDA receptors of the harmala alkaloids. Um, the harmala alkaloids are agonists at this receptor. It turns out what we call alpha 2 agonists. This is drugs like clonidine or alpha 2 agonists. Um, the alpha-2 agonist clonidine and lefexidine contain something called an imidazoline group. And it's the imidazoline rather than the alpha true, uh, group that's actually mediating this effect. And the harmala alkaloids uh, are imidazoline receptor agonists. And this re reduces opioid withdrawal in platinum models. So here you have the harmala alkaloids have a structural resemblance to ibogaine. And they reduce opioid withdrawal. But the problem with that theory is that ibogaine lacks affinity for the receptor that's mediating the harmala alkaloid effect. So another, another theory, kappa agonists. Um, this one has come and gone. Uh, this is a paper by Stan Glick. Stan Glick himself is not real enthusiastic about this theory anymore. Uh, what this means is that briefly, uh, when a capioid, kappa opioid agonist was given, there was a reduction or antagonist of, uh, there was a reduction in uh, the opioid, um, the effect of ibogaine on self-administration. It was transient um, and uh, it did not prevent, um, it doesn't prevent ibogaine from uh, diminishing withdrawal, which is carbon, uh, its cardinal uh, effect. Also, ibogaine is not thought to be a, a full kappa agonist. Uh, so this, um, uh, there's also another fact that, that at kappa agonists um, are generally uh, induced dysphoria uh, one of the reasons that buprenorphine is particularly tolerable uh, and often has positive effects on moods is that it is a kappa antagonist. So the kappa agonist theory of uh, ibogaine has really fallen by the wayside. Neurophysiology, the EEG, this connects with the functional effect of the dreaming. The subjective state produced by ibogaine has been attributed with the quality of a waking dream. Uh, and this is something I think the medical ethnography that in-depth interviewing with ibogaine users is of mechanistic importance. Visual phenomena associated with ibogaine tend to occur with the greatest intensity with the eyes closed. They are suppressed with the eyes open. And often there's a sense of location and interaction, interrogative exchanges with beings within an internally represented dream landscape. This is very different from what is seen with classical hallucinogens, which mainly are changes in the perception of the visual environment, not usually whole dream environments in where you're in interacting with beings and conversing with them and asking them questions, and they're asking you questions, but alterations of patterns um, and the waking visual environment. So this is a very different experience. Also reported that Ibogaine is panoramic memory, uh, the slideshow I've heard it referred to, with a high density of images, many of which uh, in in generate other related images. Uh, and there's this very high density of autobiographical images, some trivial, some not. Uh, and uh, basically, 
the, there is an analogy between the EEG state produced by Ibogaine and REM sleep, which is the dreaming stage. In the sleep EEG, there is progressively more, as you get deeper and deeper into sleep, you get slower and slower and slower waves. And then in REM sleep, during the active dreaming state, you get fast activity that's a lot like the waking state. So this is the dream state. It's a lot like the waking state in the EEG sense. And sleep consists of cycling through these states, progressively more slow waves, you go into REM, you do this cycle, it lasts about 70, 90 minutes, you do four or five of them, that's a night's sleep. This is a cat on Ibogaine. Uh, famous photo from 1957. Uh, Ibogaine is associated with an atropine-sensitive REM-like EEG state. REM is a muscarinic cholinergic state, atropine is a muscarinic cholinergic antagonist. So if you antagonize uh, this EEG, uh, you get a, uh, a, um, a rhythm uh, that is a model of REM sleep. Um, it produces, this is um, the, uh, the rhythm of REM sleep, and then you give atropine, and you shift the animal out of this rhythm. It's atropine sensitive, so it must be muscarinic, uh, muscarinically mediated. It's a muscarinic functional effect. And uh, muscarinic re uh, acetylcholine is uh, classified in, as agonists into uh, nicotinic receptors and, uh, and those that uh, bind at muscarinic receptors. Um, Ibogaine is a weak muscarinic agonist. You can't explain its, its actions on that basis. Ibogaine inhibits uh, the breakdown of acetylcholinesterase, which is a drug, uh, the drug, acetylcholinesterase, the drug that breaks down uh, Ibogaine uh, uh, acetylcholine. Uh, and we have uh, data that we recently submitted for publication. Ibogaine is very weak as acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, uh, and uh, this does not explain the cholinergic effects of Ibogaine either. Uh, and it's interesting, muscarinic agonists also have some effect on adenylate cyclase. Uh, they do potentiate analgesia to some extent. Uh, and this was also suggested by the SIBA patent that there might be a muscarinic, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, element. So we're sort of, you know, there's a story arc here and we're returning to the muscarinic uh, theories of the first patent. Um, so Ibogaine uh, is um, acetylcholine and neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is an effect mediated by muscarinic receptors uh, that corresponds to REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep is a state of heightened plasticity, a state of the consolidation of learning, of change, uh, and this sensitive, uh, this atropine sensitive rhythm may be a correlate of the dreamlike state in, in, induced by Ibogaine, and that EEG state may be a state under which um, plasticity is, um, is occurring. This is an image of microtubules. Uh, these are protein filaments that govern the structure of the cell. So these are structural elements. Structure implies function. Interaction with structure is going to change function. Uh, Ibogaine could be, uh, again, this motif, uh, Ibogaine interacting with a protein and changing its structure uh, at the microtubule level could explain uh, some kind of a very evolutionarily old process. Uh, these are energies of transition. Basically, this is the natural state. In the addictive state, and it's the lowest energy, Okay, in the higher energy states, uh, you can get stuck up here, and there's a barrier that keeps you from getting down here. And these barriers, you can get stuck, and that's, you know, these, these are difficult transitions, uh, and these are easier ones, shallower or deeper holes. Here, you've dug yourself into a deep hole. There's a wall that keeps you from transitioning back to the natural state. Perhaps Ibogaine is lowering the energy of transition and making this wall lower. Um, it's allowing the receptor to return to its natural conformation uh, without, uh, you know, without a, a, a direct effect on receptors. So the hypothesis I'm interested in is that there's a recurrent proteomic motif uh, that is linked to G-protein signaling, uh, and uh, this interaction is particularly evident in opioid and muscarinic cholinergic systems that are linked to these receptors uh, and uh, their related signaling elements. But this is the theory of Ibogaine's mechanism of action that I think is the most accurate at this point. We do not know.